I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com, or you can also check us out on Twitter at filmmaker underscore U, or on our YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe uh, by hitting the subscribe button and check off the notification bell. Now, every week we interview a film professional to discuss their work. This, may, this is always made possible by our sponsors, OWC. For more information on how they can assist you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. Now, this week we have ed, uh, editor Eddie Hamilton, whose work includes both of the Kingsman movies, uh, multiple Mission Impossible movies, and uh, the upcoming Top Gun Maverick, among so many other great films. So welcome to the show, uh, Eddie. Thanks, Gordon. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we, we interviewed Chris, uh, one of your assistants, a few months ago, um, and one of the things we talked about was the importance of the balance of uh, work-life balance. So how do you work with your team to ensure that, life, that you know, work-life balance when it's such a, an intense uh, project like Mission Impossible or Top Gun Maverick? Okay, so I make sure I have enough people on the team, firstly so that there's always a little bit of um, extra bandwidth. Um, so if somebody uh, is sick or if somebody wants to go home to support their wife uh, or their kids or they're going to a birthday party or a christening or, you know, something important like that, I, I always tell them just to go and just say to me, this is, this is what I'm doing because I... I Hi, I, I always encourage my team to to make sure they don't miss out on anything which is important like that. It's it's so critically important that you know the job um, doesn't uh, stop you from from living your you know life outside work. Um, yeah, a lot of my team cycle into into work. Some of them take the train into London and they, and then they cycle. Um, I try and cycle as much as I can. And we do plank club <laughs> around four o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. So we'll, we'll do like a load of exercises where we'll do planks and we'll do one arm plank and then up down plank and all this kind of fun stuff. Um, most days of the week we do that. Yeah. And so did you get yeah. tea time for plank, <laughs> plank time? I know, I know, I know. No, but it's like the, the, there are important things that you can't miss, you know, Christmas, birthday birthdays valentine's day your wedding anniversary your kids birth, all that stuff i'm like never miss that um and so that that's kind of how we do it and i uh i i have a, a system at home that i use to work um if i need to kind of catch up a little bit but i'll try and leave the cutting room in good time to get home hmm. And see my family a bit, and then if I need to do a few more hours uh, at home, or if I need to work with the director at home through Evercast, then sometimes I'll do that. Um, but that's how I manage my work-life balance. And and I'm, I have certainly committed terrible work-life balance crimes earlier in my <laughs> career, and I, I've cer I'm certainly in a much better place than I was maybe ten years ago, um, where you know, there was less resources on the films I was working on. So I was taking a lot more on my shoulders and I was, I was working many more hours to sort of get the work done. Um, but yeah, we, you know, the whole movement, look, I'm standing up in, in the cutting room right here. You know, I'm standing, I'm standing on a balance board. So everyone should get one of these. They're really awesome. And um, yeah, so, so that's how we do it really. Wow. Now, do you think like, I guess, A, how did, COVID impact this? Because I feel like going home and working from home, all of a sudden, all your team is, you know, your life is also your work at that point. And like yeah, it's interesting. So we were still finishing Top Gun when, um, when COVID struck, we were, we were prepping Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. but we were still finishing visual effects reviews and a little bit of editorial and sound and stuff on Top Gun. So I basically, yeah, I worked from home. I was in London actually, uh, and a lot of the, the my editorial team were in LA. Visual effects was based in LA, so they would send media across to me, and, and we I would look at it every morning. And then there'd be like two or three hour ever evercast calls in the evening my time to go through all the visual effects. And then we actually did the Top Gun sound mix here, uh, and 
so a lot of it was sort of done remotely you know the team in LA would listen in and and get and listen to playbacks and stuff but um and then we started back in September last year and we were actually based at the studio since then so we haven't been at home quite as long as a lot of people um, and we just had very very strict covid protocols where we were all in our own rooms and we were wearing you know face coverings the rest of the time and having regular covid tests you know like a lot of productions but but certainly we weren't sharing rooms and we weren't having communal lunches and all that stuff which you know we used to do do you think, because um, one of the questions when we first got hit by COVID, like I noticed people like Zach Arnold was championing, changing the way the industry yeah. works. Yeah. Do you think COVID will impact us or change us in a way that for the better, hopefully? Yeah, well, it's certainly in the, the, the technology to allow us to work remotely has certainly been, you know, there's been a laser focus on that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Evercast has picked up many more users and as a result they've invested heavily in, in software development and stability um, to make sure that the, the you know the remote editing experience is as smooth as it can be and um, you know any most people know how to zoom and how to sort of switch their microphone on and use their webcam and so it's a bit less daunting for everybody to be asked to work remotely you know um, I've certainly done Evercast, you know, editorial reviews with all kinds of people um, at movie studios um, and none of them have had any problem with it. And so I think that that's certainly uh, been a big shift. And I suspect strongly that people won't want to drive from Hollywood to Santa Monica, yeah. et cetera, you know, quite as much just to review something quickly or to pitch something or whatever. That's, that's the impression I get. Um, and I completely understand why you wouldn't want to, you know, drive on the 10 freeway to Santa Monica <laughs> on a Friday afternoon just yeah. for just for a half hour pitch meeting or for a quick editorial review. But having said that, there is no substitute for being in the room with somebody when you're trying to be collaborative and work fast. Mm -hmm. I think it is undoubtedly a little slower working on Evercast. But, you know, we did so much. The whole of Top Gun was finished. All the music was recorded. We did all the music reviews. I mean, everything was done remotely. Um, and, you know, the movie turned out really well, ultimately. Um, so, you know, it can be done. I, I, I do prefer being in a room with a director, though. Now, we have a slew of questions coming in here. <laughs> They're just popping up my, uh, my, uh, my vision here, Jack. Go ahead. Jack wants to know, the Kingsman movies have such a unique look to them. Yeah. Uh, how did you come up with the style for those incredible fight scenes in terms of editing? Um, I, I'm going to give most of the credit to Brad Allen, the fight designer, and his team. They do fairly elaborate stunt viz for those fight sequences. So they are actually coming up with the choreography and the camera moves months and months before we film on set. Um, what they don't do, though, is they tend to film it on an iPhone or a GoPro or something, which is kind of an artificially sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's a kind of artificial, artificially easy camera to use to do kind of, you know, fast rotations or fast snap, you know, tracks or dollies or whatever. And so when you try and do it with an Alexa or a Sony Venice or something it, it, with with, you know, prime lenses, it can be a, bit, a little trickier. So. That's the one thing which um, you, you have to just be sensitive to when you're working with stunt viz. Um, you, you know, the opening of the first King, the second Kingsman was this big uh, car chase through London in a black mm -hmm. cab, I, if you remember that. And um, I actually worked on that movie for about, I think it was nearly 20 weeks prepping that. And, you know, so nearly six months of sitting in, a, in an in editorial working on storyboards and pre -viz and stunt viz and ripping things from YouTube and building reels to sort of show Matthew Vaughan the concepts of each sequence. Um, but yeah, for most of the fight sequences on the first Kingsman, I was actually on set taking, uh, you know, a feed from the video tap and cutting the, the fights kind of live as it were. Mm. And, 
yeah, it, it was quite fun, but you, 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 it, they're so, it's so intricate and so complicated and you're, you're focusing on, you know, trying to get the exact choreography for kind of that, which is 18 frames in the timeline. And they will do, you know, 20 or 30 takes sometimes just to get that movement right, because mm. th it's this Hong Kong style of, of action, which is whereby you don't really film coverage for the fight. You just film specific beats with, you know, the exact piece of story that you're telling with an exact detailed camera move. But the, 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 that was a long way of saying it's prepped for months in advance. So you, you don't make it up on the day it's prepped and it's shown to Matthew and then it's revised. And then like everything, it's like, it's just endless iterations to kind of continually improve it. And then we're working with music and then we're even, you know, we keep refining it a lot in editorial for months afterwards as well. Um, you know, you've worked yeah. on lots of big films with huge elaborate fight scenes. Is there something you learned from all these um, big productions, that yeah, I a young the, editor. The, oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. So, so I understand the question. Um, there, there's, there's a few. So, so for action sequences, um, it's great if if the cast know their choreography, so you don't have to cut. And I'm sure you you may have heard that from from many other editors. Um, but if the style of the movie is, is if, if a kind of more handheld, frenetic, cutty style is preferable, then as long as you answer the, the key action questions of, you know, who, what, why, when, where, and, and how, if you answer all those questions so that the audience understands the stakes of the fight and who is fighting and why they're fighting and where they're fighting and, you know, what the time limit of the fight is and, all that stuff then um you'll be invested and you will care about the outcome and that you know all the work that you do before the fight is as important you know so that's what i would say is is geography is key and understanding the character's motivations is key and the stakes like what happens if the characters succeed or fail mm -hmm. that is ultimately what it makes the difference between a fight scene that you're kind of leaning into and invested in and one which you know, is um, it's just kind of eye candy and fireworks without having, you know, emotional stakes. Uh, and I, I'm, you know, this, I'm sure I'm not teaching anybody anything when I say, you know, when people buy a movie ticket, they're, 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 they're choosing a certain type of emotional experience. And it, it's very important that every single shot in the movie holds the audience's hand and guides their emotions on that emotional journey. And that's primarily why we do this. It's just about creating an emotional experience for the audience and always, always, always remember that. I mean, that's all that matters ultimately at the end of the day. Now, um, Christian wants to know, uh, how is uh, editorial collaboration um, working how does that work when you're in different countries for you it's a challenge i will say it is a challenge uh sometimes it it it, it can actually be helpful because you have a few hours head start on whoever else you're collaborating with and so sometimes there's work that you can do while the other team is asleep um but media management is challenging and syncing you know, keeping the, the avid projects in sync and making sure that you've always only got one version of, of, of each kind of reel of the movie. I, I feel that's holy grail when you're editing is that there's like one master version of anything. And quite often what will happen is we will have 12 hours a day where the master version of the movie is kind of locked to one country and then it's sent over to the other country and then the next 12 hours they have it locked and anything that I'm working and I'm working in subsequences. So when I get the master copy back, then I'll go in and drop the stuff in that I've been working on. Um, that's, that's how we do it. But, but making sure that you have a team who understands that and understands, you know, a rock solid workflow so that you never end up with, you know, multiple versions of anything is, is critically important. Now, I, I thought this, this one I kind of find um, funny because when I looked at your IMDb, it said Mission Impossible 7 and Mission Impossible 8. 
Yeah. So this person is, are you currently editing Mission Impossible 7? And what are you, what are you hoping your future projects will be? Well, that Mission Impossible 7 and 8, yeah, they are filming two movies pretty much back to back. Um, they are gigantic, epic, sweeping, fantastic, you know, gigantic, emotional, exciting movies. Um, and, you know, that's going to take nearly three years of my life. So I'm, I'm not really wondering what I'm doing beyond that, to be honest. I'm just going to focus on getting through these movies as best I can. And um, I'll worry about anything else later you know I'm but clearly I would love to work with Matthew Vaughan again in the future but I'm I'm thrilled to work with Christopher McQuarrie and and Tom Cruise on projects as well because they make all of them make great movies you know and it's really 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 hard to make good movies you know which, which we'll all learn you know over time yeah 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 it's very hard um that same person Chad I wanted to know what is it like to work with Tom Cruise um it is a pleasure i care passionately about these movies mm -hmm. i've wanted to do this since i was eight years old it's it's working in the film industry is all i've ever dreamed of doing and so i'm nearly 50 now and i've been doing it professionally for you know getting on for i mean 25 years i suppose uh and I pinch myself every morning that I get to wake up and go to work on movies. It's, it's the best. It is, it's a, it's a great way to, mm -hmm. to, to collaborate experience kind of artistic collaboration uh, with people. And Tom Cruise works harder than anyone else. He he's, you know, I think one of the reasons we, we work well together is we're both incredibly passionate about, we're excited to be doing it. We're enthusiastic. We're passionate about giving the audience the very best experience in a movie theater. And I think he, he when he sees collaborators who, who are really committed to delivering like world-class work constantly, um, then, you know, he's thrilled to work with them. Uh, he's, he's incredibly generous. Um, he he works you know he really sets the bar very high on set but he has impeccable manners and a fantastic work ethic and you know how can you not love that you know it's it is he leads by example and everyone else is you know working as hard as they can to get to his level and i mean no one else succeeds because he is so focused and dedicated and committed and i can guarantee that he eats better and drinks more healthily and works out more than, you know, 99% of the people in the world. <laughs> and, and so it's great to, to have that example set for you, you know, and have a leader like that. What's amazing is I've never heard anyone, everyone I've talked to who's worked with them have all said the same thing. They're like basically yeah. hardest worker, really nice guy. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, so it's it's always so generous so yeah. generous and polite that's the you know um works hard i mean produces these movies actually one thing that's really great is that um you know everyone on the crew is is helping you know at this stage when he's producing the movies we're helping make his film mm -hmm. and and ultimately it's it, what he says goes so mm -hmm. you know when it comes down to it there's a committee of one which is a very, uh, which is a, which is an incredible luxury when you're making a film, you know, and but then he's the first person to admit if he's if he's um, if his instincts are wrong. I mean, they you not you know he's right like ninety nine times out of a hundred he's right, but he's very happy to admit if if he's if he's wrong about something or if you have a better idea, he always wants to hear it, you know. Interesting. Now we have a question here from Peter who wants to know what is your process when you start to cut a scene. Right. Okay. So, um, do you know what? I actually made some notes about this the other day. I'm going to call up my notes and I'm going to tell you because I started thinking about what are the things that I do? What are the questions mm -hmm. that I ask myself when I edit a scene? So I actually have them right here we go. 
questions to ask when starting to cut a scene. These are all the notes that I've made to myself. So what is the scene about emotionally? That is obviously the critical, most important thing. Read the script, figure out what the emotional beats are for each character. Beware of information only. Good scenes are about character and emotion and relationships between characters, which is in a way more interesting than the characters themselves. It's about how the characters interact with other characters. You know, like Luke Skywalker on his own is only as, isn't as interesting as Luke Skywalker with Princess Leia and Han Solo. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, whose point of view is the scene from? That is a critical thing, which I wish I'd kind of been, been told to think about earlier in my career. It did take me quite a while to come around to appreciating the strength of point of view of a scene. And when you watch really great, well edited scenes, there is almost always a strong point of view from a ca particular character um, who the audience is empathizing with at that moment. Um, how can we put pressure on the lead protagonist? So usually uh, it's seeing a character being put under more and more pressure through um, you know, they make a choice at the end of the first act and then they're put under more and more pressure in the second act as things get progressively worse and worse and worse for them. And then in the third act, it's about, you know, a fight back from a low point. And so it's thinking about how to put pressure on the on the character and then um, also make sure you introduce characters possibly um, pro properly in a, in a scene. So if it's a character's first time you're introducing them, give them an entrance and tell the audience that this is a character that you need to pay attention to. Uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Um, uh, how does the character feel at the start of the scene? How does the character feel at the end of the scene? Where does that change occur in the scene for that character? Those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about. And then technically what I do is um, I watch all the dailies and as I'm going through, I kind of build a large selects reel of all the greatest hits on different video layers. Uh, so each kind of setup will be on a different layer. So I clip, I color the clips so that each character in a scene is a different color. So I can see at a glance how much each character is being used in the scene. Um, and then I will just throw something on the timeline without worrying too much about it because nothing is going to be very good the first time and then I'll just slowly refine it. And it will usually be long and dull and painful to watch. And, you know, it'll have no focus and it'll drift around. And But I'm trying to kind of listen to the director giving the actors notes in the dailies and choose pieces where I can hear the director saying, you nailed it, or that's great, or let's move on. We got it, we got it, let's move on. And I'll start to build the scenes around that. And then, you know, you, you refine them over, months you know and in the case of Top Gun it was almost a year of editing so you're you are refining every shot in the movie every day for almost a year you know so that that's how long it takes to kind of for, for the for the ingredients to simmer down into a kind of a beautiful um, meal to eat you know I hope that answers your question guys I hope that's useful <laughs> <laughs> well when you're you're spending a year on it or 10 months like how do you yeah May, may maintain your focus or your interest in a scene or a moment because it can get yeah. uh, very monotonous watching the same scene over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think um, I think this isn't, again, I, I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but uh, the, the basic thing is like trying to change your mindset from an editorial mindset to a, to a, to a, a viewing mindset, uh, maybe step away from the keyboard and, and so you can't just stop and fiddle and just force yourself to watch something, invite assistants into the room to watch it, ultimately have screenings, listen to people. Um, it's that kind of thing. And the moment that someone else is watching the scene with you in the room, any number of people, you immediately get a vibe or a sense of what, what the strengths of the scene and the weaknesses of the scene. Um, I'm sure you've all heard this many times, but that, that, that kind of works for me. And then um, it's always about, you know, drilling down on the scene and the running time and, you know, interrogating every frame of the movie to make sure that it is essential. Um, and, you know, stress testing every cut to make sure that it, that it deserves to be in the movie, basically, every shot, you know, um, and that's what you do when you're working with a lot of 
you know, with a big budget and where there's a lot at stake mm-hmm. and, and, you know, the film has to be a slam dunk. You know, everyone obviously wants to make a hit film, but it's, it's incredibly difficult, uh, mm-hmm. astonishingly difficult. And so, um, you know, you really want to make sure that you've exhausted every uh, creative mm-hmm. avenue, you know, and be super thorough. Now, Jack wants to know, where do you go for uh, inspiration? Um, I just go to the movies. Uh, it's that simple. Like, I, I, so when I'm in the weeds on a scene, as 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 editors, we often are, and, and you're kind of focused on, you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds or a two minute scene or whatever it is, uh, you just sometimes lose sight of 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 what it's like to experience a story being told over two hours. And so quite simply, I go to the movies and just, you know, watch movies or sometimes go back and watch classic movies. Um, I watched this Sidney Lumet movie the other day, uh, which was from the 60s. And and just to sort of, it's edited by Ralph Rosenblum, Mm. Rosenblum, a film called Failsafe, which is, it's just, you know, it's a fantastic, really powerful, intense, aggressive, aggressively edited in places movie, uh, beautifully edited film actually. And, you know, that that kind of refreshes your palate a bit. But for me, that that's it. It's also, you know, reading books and, you know, walking outside, going to art galleries, you know, going to concerts, tr- trying to, you know, bounce ideas off other friends. Um, if, if you're up against a wall, you know, take a shower, go for a walk, whatever, that, that kind of stuff normally clears my head and I swim. Sometimes, you know, that kind of thing. If that, I hope that answers your question. Any particular books you're reading right now? Because you said you read books. Um, <laughs> that was my gotcha uh, I, No, no, I'm, re- I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reading a Jack Reacher novel at the moment because I, oh, yeah. I, I really like, I mean, I love how Lee Child writes uh, and it's a very different, way of structuring a story. Although I quite like, it's interesting when you read the Jack Reacher books, some of them are first person and some of them are third person. And mm. it actually is similar to what, um, if you're doing a single protagonist movie, which is like a novel in the first person or a multiple protagonist movie, like a lot of superhero movies like X-Men mm. and stuff, a multiple protagonist. And that's like writing a novel in the third person where you switch point of views. So I kind of like looking at the storytelling and, and how, so, in the first person Jack reaches, they very rarely leave. In fact, I don't think they ever leave his point of view. So it's very similar to a movie like Die Hard or something, which is, you know, mostly from that character's point of view. Uh, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I'm just kind of in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about the storytelling and, and the structures and, but, you know, novels are, are very internal. Like I'm very interested to see how they're going to, do the Jack Reacher TV series because a lot of the things that Jack Reacher does are not necessarily visual, you know? So I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be great. And I'm interested to see how they translate the, 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 the story mechanics in the novel, which work great on the page to kind of more visual storytelling ideas um, in the TV show they're developing. Hmm. Now, uh, one wants to know, you previously said it was a key step working with Lee Smith on first oh wow yes wow to be trusted yeah. to step into big films uh any advice for finding an editor willing to do that uh for the editors um uh, for for young editors coming up that is interesting i mean i was in a very unique situation there because i'd done kick-ass with matthew vaughan mm-hmm. and the the schedule on x-men first class was very very tight mm-hmm. it was a seven month sh- filming schedule and then two months later, the movie was in cinemas. So yeah. there was a lot to go through and we had very little time to get it done. And so I, I think it was useful that, and Matthew said to Lee, would you mind if this young editor called Eddie comes on and, and, and Lee very graciously said, absolutely great, no problem, no problem. And so um, he, he did a lot of the heavy lifting, don't get me wrong. And, and I kind of helped him out when there was like too much footage for a scene, he would he would sometimes throw a scene together and then move on to the next scene because there was more footage coming in, you know. And so I would like hoover through all the rest of the dailies, and then I would 
you know, come up with other shots and ideas to show him. And, and sometimes he would incorporate those ideas and stuff. But um, I did all the split screen sequences, which were really massively time consuming on that film and stuff. But advice, but I, I think um, you've just got to, you've just got to let people know that that's what you want to do. And just that you've got to put it out there, basically. You can, you can contact any editor by writing to their agent. They will always forward on, um, a, a, you know, an old fashioned snail mail or most, or an email. Like I get quite a lot of contact from my agent. So you can write to any editor out there who is on IMDb with an agent, and then you can ask them and get advice and just tell them that you like their work and that you want to work with them. And, you know, th another way to do it is be an assistant. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of first assistants sometimes get bumped up to additional editors or co-editors or full editors. So I think, you know, just just let people know that that's what you want to do. Not everyone, not all assistants wants to edit. Actually, some of them are very happy being career assistants. So you must make, you know, and I I say to my team on, on, on Mission Impossible, cut as much scene, cut any scene that you want. I want to see it. I want to see your ideas and you know, and if something's great, I'll put it in the movie. And, but the, the, the work, the days are quite intense, but I, I'm always encouraging the team. Like I'd love them all to do one scene a week. And then we all look at it on Friday, but some days it's just, it's just not, it's just insanely busy. Some weeks mm -hmm. there isn't time, but you know, I'm, I'm, I want my team to cut as much as they want. And then, sh and then let's look at it and see what's, you know, what could be in the movie. Now, is there a scene or a, um, something you've cut that you're you're most proud of in your career and what were some of the challenges behind that this movie right here is the <laughs> hardest thing i've ever done by many orders of magnitude and in fact this sequence when this is in the trailer this shot which is why i put it up but when when you see the the sequence with this shot in it yeah. i it took me about three months to do the first assembly of it and it was very slow and very painstaking because there was so much footage and the whole movie was like that really that's why it took that's why it took a year a year to edit I, I, it's just so time consuming so in fact the whole of top gun maverick when you see it i had help from two other editors who came on you know um for a few months each to help because it was so overwhelming the quantity of footage but but overall um this is definitely this is this is definitely the movie I'm most proud of. And, and it was the hardest because it was just purely the amount of footage. It's, it's a colossal amount of footage to go through. Um, and just to be thorough, because I never want to leave a movie not knowing that all the best shots are in the film. And just to go through it all and, and, and make sure that everything was the best was just, you know, some days I would only do like five seconds on the timeline and that would be a whole day's work. So that, that, that shows you how long it takes because you're looking, you're just combing through hours and hours and hours of footage looking for very small pieces that are dynamic enough to put in the movie. So, but yeah, I, I, I'm so proud of it. I can't wait for people to see it. When do you, do you know when that's going to be released? Because they've been pushing things around with the film. Well, currently it's, it's November. So it's, it's around Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, so, it, and it, it really delivers. I, I, I've seen the film with enough people to know that you won't be disappointed, you know. Um, and, and I know most people under the age of 30 haven't seen the original Top Gun <laughs> either. So, so, but you're still in for a treat. It, it doesn't matter if you've seen the original or not, you know, it's, it's just a, a stunning, stunning movie. I, I'm so excited for people to see it, uh, genuinely. It's, it's, and, you know, the sound mix was just next level exciting to be part of that. And the music is amazing and, you know, it's all just, it, it really delivers, you know, I, I really hope that everyone loves it around the world when they see it. Now, I have a question I've been asking everyone I do these interviews with uh, the live yeah. ones. Um, because we've been in COVID, a lot of people are in lockdown, certain areas mm. go in and out of lockdown. So a lot of people have been watching streaming services. Yeah. Uh, is there a something you've discovered on streaming service during COVID that you would recommend to people? Um. You know, I think one of the most entertaining evenings I spent was watching Palm Springs. Oh, yeah. If you haven't yeah, seen Palm Springs, 
it's a it's a home run and it's so yeah. inventive and so fresh and so original and so clever and the comic timing is just perfection and it's got great twists and it's beautifully structured and so that would be my top tip if you haven't seen palm springs it's you, you know it's one of those it's not for kids all right <laughs> don't sit down with your kids to watch it especially the first five minutes where you'll be like okay this is a bit awkward with my child sitting there but um it, it's so good I, yeah. I i mean that was i mean, really one of the comedy highlights in terms of just kind of having a laugh <laughs> yeah you know and trying to enjoy yourself when you know there's all this craziness going on in the world um that would be my top tip if that answers your question yes, yeah that's probably oh another thing is um, it's a sin which i think is on hbo yeah, over there it was on channel four here it mm. is an astonishing i think it, it's actually the best thing i've seen on tv in terms of a series this year it's a sin it's about a group of friends in the 1980s in london mm. uh coming to terms with the the kind of tidal wave of hiv um and oh, it's, i think i have heard of that yeah. yeah it's very very moving uh it, it's so good it's so good but it is a tough watch but it is it's so moving and so powerful it's a sin so those are my two tips if you want like a, i think it's five or six one hour episodes it's a sin it's fantastic yeah. and then a movie watch palm springs for a laugh <laughs> well thank you very much for letting us interview uh, and that's it for this week. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com and on social media at filmmakeru, uh, at filmmaker underscore you on Twitter and on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe and hit the uh, bell for notifications. We'd also like to thank owcdigital.com for supporting us this week. I'm your host, Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Thanks very much, uh, Eddie. Pleasure. Thanks, Gordon.